Well, good morning, church. Great to be with you on this Sunday in the month of August. We are in a teaching series through the book of Titus. So if you have a Bible or a device by which to access the Bible, if you would, go to the second chapter of this little New Testament book. It's actually a letter that was spoken, not written by Paul. It's more of a didactic writing, meaning that Paul spoke to someone who wrote it down for him, and then it was transferred to Titus, and then also shared to others on the island of Crete. But today, we plan, Lord willing, as is our custom, as is our rhythm, as is our value, I guess you could say, to listen and learn from God's word so that we can love live and lead just like, does anybody know? Good. Yes, that's Laney's job Monday through Friday. We say that little statement before devotions every day. And Laney's t- two cents is Jesus. The other six children have other pieces, that, or other five. There's only six. Um, other five children. Other five children say, oh, I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. I'm here to love. I'm here to lead. da 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 And uh, Laney, like who? Jesus. Amen, Laney. Laney begins preschool in the morning. It's amazing how fast time goes. Yeah. But Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is our intention today. If you're there, would you let me know by saying, I I like Jesus? That's great. Okay, here we are. I'm going to read it to you from the New Living Translation, and this is how it reads. Verse 1 through 10. These aren't my words, not my thoughts. I really do believe these are the inspired words from God. As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect. And to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with with love and patience, he says. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. Can I just say, don't you love Paul's graciousness here? Now he describes individuals. Teach the older. The older. Doesn't necessarily say old. He just says older. Anyway, these older women, well, let me back up. Similar, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, should teach others what is good. These older women, well, they must train the younger women to, to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely, to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, to, to even be submissive to their husbands. Then you will not bring shame on the word of God, he says. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself, speaking to Titus, must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. And slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or steal, but show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive in every way. Father, I thank you for your word. I just pray as we spend some time listening and maybe learning and just kind of absorbing in the scriptures, Lord, that your spirit would calm our hearts and minds. Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that you'd help me to just be of a support, but to not be the center of attention. But Lord, that you would be. And God, I just ask that you'd bless this time. Give us ears to hear what you'd have to say, eyes to see, and a heart that's ready to follow after you. And I pray that in the name that has been the most kind to me in my my whole life. I pray this in the, the powerful name, the precious name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. 
Now, the meat of the message to Titus here in this chapter, I would say is really from verse 2 to 10. We really see the heart, though, I would say, in verse 1, second part of verse 10, and even on into verse 11. And as such, I thought I would read it again to you, just those verses, but out of the New King James, more of a word-for-word -word translation. I'll put it up on the screen. He says, but as for you, speaking to Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And then in verse 10, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I got to be honest with you. I really, really like that. Verse 11, the grace of God has appeared to all and brings salvation. Can I share this with you? I really do believe that it's God's heart for you to thrive in your love relationship with him, to deeply know him. doesn't matter who you are, what yesterday held for you, what you think tomorrow might bring. But I really do firmly believe that where you are right now, God knows, he sees, he cares. And God is in the business of taking ash and turning it into beauty. God is in the business of taking broken things and making them whole. God has the track record for taking those that are sad and giving them joy. This is who God is. And if I can have your attention, I would say this. He wants you to do what? To experience life as he created it to be. You know, Jesus said this one time. There's an enemy and he comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I have come that you might go to church. No, that's not what he said. I have come that you might have life and have life abundantly abundantly, meaning that the joy of the Lord, that's my strength, not my circumstance, not my net value, not my situation. Jesus, he's my strength. You say, why do you share that? I think it really is God's heart that you and I would come to know him. John, apostle of Jesus, put it this way, recording the words of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. Why? Why? So that whoever believes in him would not die, but have life forevermore. Jesus came to give life. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, Paul tells Timothy that God desires that all men, speaking of humankind, everywhere, it's his heart that they would be saved. So you're trying to tell me that God's not against me. Yes. Yes, he's for you. Let me put it in a negative light. You say, what do you mean? Look at Ezekiel 33, 11. I'll put it up on the screen. This is God speaking. He says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness. O people of Israel, why would you die? Like, why would you just keep going towards the path of death? God desires life. The enemy desires death. Well, how does God relay this heart to people would be a question. Well, if you would, look in your Bibles in Titus chapter 2, verse 10, second half. I'll read from the New King James. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all. This is what I'm saying. There's this adorning dynamic of God's people. Now, help me with this. What does the word adorn to mean? Does anyone know what adorn means? Decorate? Okay, that's one thing. Anything? What else does adorn mean? To wear, to dress. The Greek word is cosmeo. Anyone know maybe what our English familiar word would be? Cosmetic. Men, that would be like spackling, you know, or like, you know, stuff like that. Would be things you want to highlight or low light. That's what it is. 
Well, and that's one connotation of the word cosmeo. Oh, a dress, dr dr okay, there's also another connotation to that word adorn. It simply means to put something on. Aren't you thankful that your neighbor did that today? They adorned themselves. How awkward would this be? They adorn themselves. They put something on. There's no need to add spackle to the gospel. It's beautiful. But you do need to display it. Does that make sense? This is what he's saying. God uses us to display as we adorn the gospel to everyone and everywhere. Now, this morning, I would say that we're going to see seven situations that Paul, seven situations in life that, that Paul addresses of what it looks like to live and love and lead well, just like Jesus. First, you'll see him address Titus. Then he'll speak to the older men and older women and older and younger women and younger men. And then those in slavery. And honestly, he'll end with everyone. With this theme, with this thought, with this thesis that, listen, you're to display, adorn the gospel so that it sparkles. See, it's attractive to those who aren't experiencing life as it's meant to be lived, who have no idea what it means to be loved deeply and pursued by someone who would give everything for them. And they have no idea how to lead themselves. They're shackled to their habits, their hang-ups, their issues. Who doesn't want life? Who doesn't want to know what it means to be loved? Who doesn't want to know what it actually feels like to say, I don't have to do that anymore. It doesn't have a hold on me anymore. I would submit to you that that's available to all of us in Jesus. You see, the challenge before Titus was how to lead well. You say, why? Well, he was a young pastor. And the culture he was in, I'll just use a word that maybe not everybody's familiar with, but it was gnarly. It was intense. It was creeping into the life of the church. Remember with me, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order things that are lacking. It's bad in Crete. Things aren't going the way they should. And you need to appoint elders, appoint leaders in every single city. Anyone ever been to Crete? It's big. There's a lot of, lot of places there to appoint leaders. Titus has got a job to do. Things were not working like they could or should. You don't have to raise your hand. But as an individual or a couple or a family or a church or a community or a region or a county or a city or a state or a country or a world, would you not agree that maybe there's an element in life where things aren't working as they could? Welcome to Crete. So he tells Titus, set things in order and establish, I'll put it in the NIV, Neil's interesting version, roles, rhythms, responsibilities, Give them this dynamic of realistic goals, a reporting structure. What is that? Leadership. That's what they need. Set it in order. Things weren't working like they should. So Titus is there to lead, but he's also there to love well. Model both an attitude and actions in a way that the appropriate aroma of Christ would be experienced. Haley's Bible Handbook, if you don't have one, I would highly encourage you to get one. He comments that Cretans, these are these people that live here, he says they were bold sailors, great bowmen with loose morals. Peter, you've become a pirate. Like, that's what's happening there. You know what I mean? Like, they're pirates. That's, that's Cretan. And the book of Titus tells us, listen, I want to show you what true love looks like in attitude and actions. And Titus was also there to show how to live well, that his doctrine would become his daily, and that what he believed would translate into how he behaved. You see, Titus is a book written to leaders and believers for a time and situation when everything wasn't 1,000. I don't know about you, but let me share this with you. Not everything in my life 
is 1,000. I have only ever encountered one person, and it isn't even in this realm. Who is? Jesus. The only one. Every other hero has got a zero attached to him somewhere. But Jesus, that's the one I can trust. Jesus, I'll follow him. Jesus, you do whatever you want to do with whatever's left here. Jesus, he's faithful. He's so kind. And he's so kind that he doesn't always give me what I think I need. Like he paces himself with me in ways sometimes that I wish he wouldn't. But I've learned, ah, hindsight is clarity. That's why you did that. Okay, I can trust you. There's always something in our lives where we need more of or less of to let go of or hold on to. And before we look at our text, I'm going to share with you seven situations, I guess, different individuals. I want you to consider this simple question. Lord, what? Oh, sorry, Siri. You're not a part of this conversation. Lord, what is my situation? Am I leading myself well? Am I an older or a younger woman or man? What does that look like? Am I someone who's under and in authority? That's all of us to a certain degree. So before we jump in, may I ask this question? What is your lifestyle adorning? What is it putting on full display? Because you have tells. People can see it. You know the ABCs. You already know what I'm going to say. Attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, engagements, friends, goals, habits, interests, jokes. This shows us who you are. What are you adorning? And does it matter? Not when you die. Think bigger than that. Does it matter that when you left earth, it mattered that you were here? And will it matter in the next life? What are you adorning in your current situation? Well, let's look at Titus, how he is exhorted by Paul. In verse 1 and also in verse 7 and 8, here's how Paul is exhorted. He, he, he's exhorted by uh, Paul exhorts Titus. He says this, verse 1, As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Verse 7 and 8, he's speaking to him again directly, and he says, You yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth. So that your teaching can't be criticized, then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Titus, walk the talk. Titus, lead in a way that you both live and help others learn the truth. Titus, very simply, allow your life to be consistent. You know, I listened in onto a conversation this, this week on a podcast about a leader, a pastor, who stepped back from ministry for a bit. There was no moral or financial or theological challenge yet. But he was on the path to that. But it wasn't there yet. But in an area of his life, he realized that, you know, my habits... The way I'm living, I, I wouldn't be able to say, oh, you're having a problem with that? Let me show you how I do it. He goes, oh, wait a second. I can't recommend what I'm doing. Something's wrong. I need to take a step back. And I got to share with you, I genuinely respect that. There was this preemptive element to his spiritual health that he paid attention to. He's like, before I get broke and I see that it's coming... And so do others. Lord, let me step back from a place where others are following me. And let me see what's going on. See, here's the deal for Titus. Leaders are held to a higher standard. They just are. And so if the leader can't say, just do as I do because I'm following Christ, you got to go, 
Oh, that's a bummer. Now, don't reserve this situation for just sweet Titus. You are called to lead yourself. You are called to lead, if you're, I really believe this as a, as a man, your family. That's your spiritual responsibility. I genuinely believe that. And if there is no man present, which is often women who step into those kinds of situations that are hard and difficult, you need to know that there is grace and mercy and help for everyone who has time of need. Jesus said, cast your burdens upon me. See, when you lead because Jesus is your Lord, it's not a taskmaster type relationship. It's a love relationship. And the best thing he wants for you is to do well. And the way forward, onward and upward, is to take responsibility. You know, as a dad, I often tell this to my kids. Okay, situation happened. May not be my fault, but it is my responsibility because I'm your dad. And here's the thing that I love about Titus. Here's what he says. Titus, very simply, may the way that you live and the way you help others learn be consistent. You want to learn how to live and love and lead just like Jesus? You want to adorn the gospel? Just be authentic. Okay, then he moves on to older men in verse 2. Look at what he says. Teach the older men to exercise self-control. Be worthy of respect to live wisely. They must have sound faith. Be filled with love and patience. He says, listen to the older guys. Titus, I want you to teach them. It's got to be hard shoes for Titus to step into. But that's his instruction from Paul. He says, teach them to live life to the fullest. Not to live foolishly, half-heartedly, but live in a way that lives in light of eternity. You see, this dynamic of language, self-control, worthy of respect, live wisely, sound faith, filled with love and patience. I really believe that it was God's heart for older men at that time. You say, older men, what do you mean by that? In that culture, if you were over the age of 40, you were on borrowed time. Like some people say, oh, you're a little bit younger. I said, yeah, I'm 42, almost 43. So if I make it to 86, that means I'm halfway dead, right? So I guess I'm in the middle. I don't know if I am that much young. But like older, here's what he's saying. Live lives that are real examples. Sober has less to do with alcohol as a single substance of concern, but to live vigilantly. That's the concept that he's seeking to communicate there. Obviously, it means don't walk around like an old drunk. But here's what it really means. Don't get caught up in silliness and friviality. That's what he's saying. You got all this time on your hands? Adorn the gospel. Be someone who's still going after it. And let me see, like at the right pace and the right seat at the table. Like when I was a youth pastor, they always said, don't be that youth pastor. This isn't popular nowadays, but that wears skinny jeans and has frosted tips as a 45-year-old. You know, you're like, oh, man, that guy, he needs to wake up. And that's not your situation anymore, you know. But this, this person put it this way. I'll put it up on the screen. I really like what he said. He said, neither age nor retirement gives the older a right to live a life of license, neither in drink and eating, sex, recreation, travel, play, or in other area of life. The older who really know the Lord are not to waste time and fritter their life away. Too many people, children, men, and women, are destitute, poor, hurting, and dying from hunger, poor housing, loneliness, emptiness, and sin. It's just this dynamic that like older men, you're not done. If, if you're still breathing, God has purpose for you. Glorious purpose. How are you adorning the gospel in this season of your life? Live in a way where it matters that you're still here. Live in a way 
where it matters, all that God has invested in you. Because there are many who don't have a clue what they're doing, who could definitely glean from and learn from and listen to and benefit from your experience and wisdom. This is Paul's words. Don't, don't live frivolously, but live with focus. Live with focus. Go for it. Whatever God has in your heart that aligns with the confirmation and correction of God's word. Last thing I'll say about this before we move on to older women. I'll never forget when Greg Laurie's oldest son died. Died of a car accident. Very grievous time for him. And shortly thereafter, he started a brand new initiative called Harvest America. Where he said, you know what? We're betting the farm on this one. We're going to do our best to present the gospel in the most effective way we can to the whole nation on a single night. And he said, we're kind of betting the bank on it. And he said, I'm very tempted at this stage in my life with losing a son, being at a place where I don't have to do this anymore, to just kind of go, well, let's just do what we've done. Why try something new? It may not work out. But I really respected Pastor Greg because he said, but at this stage in my life, I still want to go after it for the gospel. And I thought, man, that's, that's admirable. That adorns the gospel. Well, then he says to older women, verse 3 and 4, similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God, that they must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. Now, remember with me, that these character qualities that, that Paul is mentioning to Titus, they're not siloed to each situation. Oh, so these women have to do this way, but the men, no, 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 it's, it's inclusive of all. Hey, remember, this is written to a very specific audience. This isn't written to you and me. This is written to actual people that lived in Crete in the first century. And there's pirates running around, so to speak. So Paul's writing, it's maybe not written to us, but it is for us. Do you understand that? That like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. That every character quality here relates. It's not just that the older ladies need not be drinkers and slanderers. That's everybody. But the point is, older women, he says, build up with your words. Don't break down. Don't be given to passive, aggressive, condescending, or assumptive comments and attitudes. Invest your life in what is good and what is most beautiful is someone who honors and obeys God. What's God's heart for marriage? You see it here in this text, part of it. Women, love your husbands and children. That's the kind of life that adorns the gospel. Look at verse, the second half of verse 4 on through 5, and we'll see what he has to say to situation number 4, the younger women. Teach them to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Let me share with you what um, Pastor Warren Wearsby says about this. He says, Paul, encouraging young women to listen to the older women, and learn from them how to be godly wives and mothers, should be sober, taking a serious attitude toward marriage and the home. I once had an individual in marital counseling that said when they wanted to get out of their first marriage for not really a good reason, well, you know, no one gets it right the first time. Like, oh, that's not a good way to do that. Um, the home is not a playground, Wearsby says. Love is vital. Please listen to this. Love is vital to a happy home. So Paul reminds these women to love both their husbands and children. I think he has to remind them because would you ever maybe say sometimes they're not that lovable? I'd say that. I know what it's like to be a husband and I have children. Sometimes we need CC to just be, you know, go the extra mile sometimes because she really does. She's awesome. That she should be faithful at home and not put outside interest above ahead of her husband and children. Why? So that the word of God be not blasphemed. He says it's tragic when a Christian home is a poor testimony for Christ because of a disobedient and careless wives and husbands whose values are confused. 
The husband or wife who neglects the home is worse than an unbeliever. So that's why I don't want you to get siloed with this. Why does he say this just to women? No, no, no. If you study Christianity, Christianity is one of the most leveling of the playing fields for gender, race, class that society has ever seen. Study the history. What he's saying here is let the home be an example. Read Ephesians, read other places in 1 Corinthians where you get the full scope of the biblical perception of what a healthy marriage and home looks like. But here's his heart behind it. Hey, don't neglect what's here for what could be out there. Don't do that. That's not a life that adorns the gospel. I'll never forget what um, John Corson shared with me when I lived in Oregon. He said, Neil, Jesus was a traveling without a home rabbi with a ragtag group of 12 men. For him, those disciples became his family. At this time in my life, I was probably 23, 24. He said, Neil, should someone be crazy enough to marry you? I put that in there. That's me. I think that's what he meant. But should you ever marry? And should you ever have children? Your family becomes your first disciples. The point here is, is don't forsake that which is so precious at home. But let love be like the fluid of viscosity that helps the grinds of marriage work. Love covers a multitude of sins. And where it is best displayed, and if I can have your attention where it's most needed, is just at home. So many people are so broken because of what happened at home. And it's interesting who's the responsible party. Mom and dad. Not the school teacher. Not the civic leader. It's mom and dad. Don't do it alone. But there you are. And in verse 6, he talks to the younger men. He says, in the same way, can you believe how short this is? Encourage the young men to live wisely. One thing, that's all they get. You know why? You know what that means? If I can put this in the NIV, Neil's interesting version. Don't be a fool. There's a whole book of Proverbs about that. That's what he's saying about the young. You know that mentality sometimes, well, boys will be boys. No, 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 no. That's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Boys won't be boys. Boys need to be live wisely. Boys, I have two, are a little bit like a pickup truck. They drive a lot straighter with a little bit of a load in the back. Does that make sense? You give them some responsibility. You give them a job to do. You know, Ollie, you know what's going to happen today at our house? I love Ollie Sundays. I know you don't know who Ollie is. Ollie is our golden doodle. And so what Ollie Sundays is, is we go outside, not we, my boys and my girls help. It is time to pick up the Ollie plops. <laughs> I love Ollie Sunday. That's what you do. There's also I love our home Sunday. There's a wonderful list there that they take care of. But anyway, men, younger men, be self-controlled. Now, in verse 9 and 10, he talks to slaves, and he says, Slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. Don't talk back or steal, but show themselves to be entirely trustworthy. Now, I must say this, trustworthy and good. There's different areas in Scripture in which slavery is mentioned and addressed. Please listen to me. Here nor anywhere does the Bible condone slavery especially how a 21st century American interprets that word. But in Titus 2, Paul simply acknowledging that in the Roman Empire, first century, historians would tell you, depending on who you read, anywhere from 10% to 40% of the Roman Empire was comprised of slaves. Slavery in this time was not based on race or discrimination, but were often prisoners of war or indentured individuals who could not pay a debt so they would be a slave for a while and then earn their freedom back. And then some, because they so enjoyed that situation, would become bond slaves. They would choose to be that. One could buy back his freedom or stay. 
The radical thing about Christianity in this time is that it leveled the playing field. Pastor Gary Hamrick of Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia, shared this insight that Christianity is the great equalizer. One could come to church in Crete, have slaves and masters serving at the same church, and in fact, slaves could even serve as the leaders in the church over their masters. So here's the point. Paul's not saying God condones slavery. No. He's saying if you find yourself as a slave, as a believer, here's how you live. Here's how you lead. Acknowledge the Lord. Live for him. The focus is Jesus. This is the kind of life, if I can have your attention, if you're under authority. Uh, wake up. You are. You live in a governed land. You are, in, you are under authority. You may have a boss. You may. This is how you do things. As unto Jesus. That's what adorns the gospel. That's what will change your home, your community, your nation. Do it as unto the Lord. That's what adorns the gospel. Now, number seven, the situation. I would say this. Look at the second half of verse 10 where he says, they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. I think he's speaking specifically of those that found themselves in slavery. But I'd also say this. It's true for all of us. When we live what we say, when our life evidences love and the ability to have self-control, leadership over our own life. See, when someone fully grasps that they are forgiven in Christ, set free, part of a family of God in which they have a unique function to play, that life can have an element of spiritual fun to it because Jesus is our joy and he's our strength and that we have a future, let me share something with you. Someone who's forgiven and free, part of a family of God, and has a specific function, like, man, I'm wired this way and I'm actually purposeful. And they realize that the joy of the Lord is their strength. They're actually a fun person to be around and they know they have a future. That person's not a bummer. Like when you engage that kind of person, you're like, man, I just, I just, I just, I just like talking to that person. They don't make me feel drained. They help me dream. They, they don't make me feel like, ugh. They make me feel, I, I like seeing that name on the thread. This is a life that adorns the gospel. Someone that gets it. I'm forgiven. Set free. Part of the family in which I have a function. Life can be fun in Jesus and I have a future. This is the kind of life that makes the gospel attractive. You don't have to dress up the gospel. No cosmetics needed. You just need to put it on. Did you know that you talk to yourself more than anyone else talks to you? Did you know that? The best thing you could do for yourself is preach the gospel to yourself every single morning. God loves me. He has forgiven me. I'm his kid. He has a plan for me today. The enemy, steal, kill, and destroy. But you know, I wish there was a church that every morning when I wake up, I could do, like I could get into God's word. Preach the gospel to yourself. And maybe you won't be so salty. That's what was going on in Crete, these pirates. Show them how to love, how to live, how to lead. You see, as a community, we're here to love God, connect together, and live on mission. I love this little illustration that Chuck Swindoll shared. I'm going to read it to you as we close. Great illustration about what does it look like to adorn the gospel. He says, there's an old story of St. Francis of Assisi. He tells of the day when he said to one of his students, come with me, let's go down to the village and preach the gospel to the people who need our savior. And he says, off they went. Once at the gate, they stopped but down to speak kind words to a crippled old man, gave him a cold drink of water, a few coins. Then they saw some children playing with a ball out in the field. So they joined their game and had fun with the children while they played a lonely widow watching at her doorstep drew attention. When they finished the game, they visited with her, bringing her a few words of cheer and encouragement, and she was comforted. A fearful young man lurked in the shadows, ashamed of what he had done the night before, and they prayed with him. 
spoke with him openly about and freely about forgiveness and grace and mercy and encouraged him to pursue a more productive life. On the way out of town, they stopped at a small store and greeted the merchant, asked about his family, and thanked him for his faithful work through the years. And then St. Francis said to his team, let's go back. And the students said, but wait, when do we preach? And he said, every step we took, every word we spoke, every action we did has become a sermon. And he closes it this way. The most effective presentation of the gospel begins with a Christ-like life. Therefore, defining the character of the church should be everyday, authentic godliness. Why would they like Jesus if they see you, who's been changed by Jesus, and they don't like you? How does that work? So you win more with honey than you do vinegar. Do you need to preach the gospel with words? Absolutely. But people don't care what you know. Do they know that you care? We live in a content-rich society, but not a kindness-rich society. It's easy to spit out the Roman's road and then just say, later, bro. That's not sharing the gospel. Adorning the gospel is something you put on. Here, 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 here. And so as we close, I guess this is my question. What's your situation? Where are you? Are you leading yourself well? Older men and women, younger men and women. Are you adorning the gospel in life? Those that are under authority. Are you adorning the gospel by living unto Jesus, working for him, not for them, for him? I, okay, I'll, I'll share this. I have a friend out west. He said this, Neil, you know what's interesting about you? He said, no, I'm, I'm ready for it, though. What you got? He said, you can make friends with the paint on that wall. I said, oh, really? Is that a bad thing? He said, absolutely not. I said, well, let me share something with you. That is a learned skill set. That is not my nature. It's not how I knew how to do things. But I learned that God primarily moves in your life through people. People. That people matter. And that every single person has value, dignity, and worth because they're created in the image of God. Every single human being. Now, I have never met a human being, myself included, that I agree with 100% of the time. Sometimes I disagree with myself. (laughs) But if I can't treat someone with respect, recognize their value as created in the image of God, I think something is wrong. In here, not out here. And God wants to work in your life. He truly does. May I ask, in your situation, are you adorning a gospel that truly is genuinely good news? Good news. You can be forgiven. You can be set free. Brought into a family of God that's global, ancient, and future. He's wired you in such a way that you've got a vital part to play. You can't get around the laws of logic when you're in an argument with someone. It just doesn't work. And I would say these same things spiritually. Everyone is wired for life, love, connection, and purpose. And they're found in Jesus. It's the only one who doesn't disappoint. But you don't live as a Christian as one who's embraced individuality. It's just about me. You are an individual, but saved into and be a part of a community. And no one ever gets healthy alone. 
So my encouragement to you is to consider this. What's your situation? What's your next step? Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. We'd love to introduce you to him and give you a resource that will greatly help you. We'd love to get to know you. See if we can be of support in your journey. Nobody's born, bred, and dead in the same place in church anymore. You may not be here forever, but while you're here, why can't we be friends? We'd like to help, but we can't help what we don't know. And I'm so thankful for you as a church that you're communicating with us. Prayer needs, feedback on ministries, dreams and desires for future initiatives like a golf tournament someone was talking to me about today. I love that you do that. And we want to walk together as we step into the fall to see more people experience what love looks like, what community can look like, what mission looks like, and what it's like to live well. I don't know anybody that does it perfectly, but at least we do it together following Jesus. So I guess my question would be this. What's your next step in the situation you're in? How do you adorn the gospel? Maybe you say, I don't know. Well, at the end of our time together this morning, there'll be some prayer team members up front. There'll be a connect desk out in the, I guess the back, but the front of the building. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Love to see you thrive in your life, in your love relationship with God, and in your leadership. We'd love to partner with you in that. So think about it. Pray about it. Let us know how we can be of assistance to you. And also recognize that indecision is a decision eventually. Potential has an expiration date. And you are alive now. Who knows what tomorrow holds? The best day to do the right thing was yesterday, but today still works. Does that make sense? Like there should be a sense of urgency when you move forward. Not frantic, not manic, but focused.